Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Zoom Into Wine. It's time for the show and your host, Ian Blackburn. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us tonight for Stars of Italian Wine. My name is Ian Blackburn. I'll be your host. And I want to thank everyone for joining us from all over the place. Uh, we've got wine going out to all parts of California. I just wanted to uh, make sure everybody's on the Zoom here. It's just going to take a moment more before we reach up to speed. Hopefully everybody had a chance to open up the email and see that we have a little brochure for you guys for this evening. And this will be our tasting order. And if you also clicked on that link, you probably saw, let's see if I can share that with you. We also have a tasting mat that we sent out to everybody. It kind of helps kind of guide things along. Right inside of this beautiful email, you got the tasting mat by clicking here and the brochure. All right. Well, welcome to Stars of Italy. We've been doing our Stars events on Zoom for quite a while now, and I believe this is our second or third version on Zoom. I have to check my records, maybe just a uh, second. But uh, for those of you that haven't done this before, you are the reason we are here. You're not just here to watch. Uh, we'd love to have you join the Zoom and be a part of it, ask questions. Use that, uh, use that, that chat box down at the bottom of your screen to um, engage questions. Uh, all the wine representatives are here and watching the Zoom with me and being involved. And, uh, and they're here to answer questions as we go along. We have a nice large audience as well. And uh, thank you, Davide, for saying hello. And uh, we want to get started. We've got a tight schedule and we're going to cover a lot of ground in a hurry. But do get your questions in if you have them. And cheers, everyone. Let's begin. Our first guest tonight, Silvio De Silvio. Where are you, my friend? The box goes right to you when you talk, when you speak, so I can find you. I want to spotlight you. Look at that beautiful view. Silvio is zooming in straight from Tuscany, where it's three in the morning. No, he's actually in San Diego, but uh, we're pretending. Uh, Silvio works for the Antonori family and he's here in Southern California. He's a good friend of mine as well. And he's got great taste in wine because he loves my beekeeper Zinfandel. So uh, I'm always a big fan of him as well. Thank you, Silvio. How you doing? Do that by yourself. All right, man. All right. I'm ready for some good wine, to be honest. Quick question for you, Ian. Uh, looks like you have uh, a Tower of Toronto in the back uh, background. It's, it's, this is our Italy uh, background. That's Leaning Tower of Pisa, and we've got all kinds of stuff back there. A Rome, little Roman architecture. You know, it's, uh, it's the best my graphic team could do. Okay. <laughs> um, I have actually Castello della Sala in my background. So all this right. is actually the property that we are going to talk about today. Fantastic. So I don't know if you want me to start, uh, Ian. I'm very happy to start anytime you want. Yeah, let me uh, let me take us into our PowerPoint and uh, just show a couple of slides, and then um, and then we'll chat about it and talk uh, and taste the wine together with the group. Um, again, this is the tasting order, the tasting mat that you've all uh, potentially discovered. So we'll go from our Chardonnay to a fantastic wine from Sicily. Heading over to Montalcino, finishing up in Tuscany with a uh, beautiful Merlot from Avionese, and then back up to Piedmont for Barolo. Our first wine tonight, uh, Silvio represents the Chavaro della Sala from Antonori. I will arguably say that it is one of the great um, white wines of the world, not just a great Chardonnay, not just a great Italian wine. This is a legendary wine every single year. Silvio, should I play this video first or should we talk first? Uh, go ahead with the video. Let's see what, what this brings us. It's about three minutes. And we could talk over it too if it's... Uh...
spend a minute smelling this beautiful white wine. Get into that Tuscan and uh, Umbrian mo mode. Definitely uh, gets us in the mood there, Silvio. And uh, I hope everyone's got the, the wine in the glass as we are starting to break in. Silvio, how long have you been with Antonori now? Uh, almost three years. Fantastic. Um, and you've, you've obviously worked in wine for a long time. We worked together back at Cobran in the early 2000s. And... Uh, how many different vintages of this wine have you had personally? Well, I was fortunate enough to have uh, actually a vertical not long ago, probably uh, that was uh, in uh, February. And we tasted on 9, 10, 11, and 12. And uh, one was better than the other. This is one of the things that uh, makes uh, Cervaro, as you said, one of the iconic wines of Italy and one of the best white wines in the world. Uh, it's one of the first Italian white wines that was designed actually to be aged. And uh, this is uh, the visionary approach of the Antinori family that, uh, and specifically of my boss, Pierre Antinori, uh, of uh, creating something uh, that would uh, break out from the, uh, the crowd. Uh, back in the days, in fact, uh, if you allow me, um, you know, I would like to give a little background all on the wine first. Um, Gervaro de la Sala was purchased by the Antinori family in 1940. And I think there is a great story that I would like to attach to this presentation because uh, not only is very funny, but it gives you a little bit of the background of the philosophy of the Antinori family as well. So the Antinori has been uh, uh, making wine for over 700 years. In fact, there are already documents that place the Antinori family uh, making wines already in 1152. So we are talking about almost 900 years. Um, the birth year of the Antinori as a commercial company goes back to 1385, which uh, makes the Antinori uh, the oldest winemaker in the world. Uh, another interesting uh, fact, uh, fun fact I would say, is that we are also the ninth oldest uh, business in the world that's still owned by the same family. Hmm. If you're curious to know which one is number one, is a, a Japanese uh, company that used to make samurai swords hmm. and eventually they move into stainless steel production. But uh, uh, that put us uh, really uh, in, a, in the center of uh, the winemaking history because uh, Nantinori was also responsible for designing the uh, first uh, wine region in the world, which is Chianti Classico, uh, which was created in 1716. Um, and now we are on into the 27th generation of the family. So uh, continuous uh, uh, ownership uh, by the same people uh, makes obviously, uh, um, makes a huge statement about the commitment of the family uh, for quality. Uh, makes a big commitment uh, uh, on uh, uh, having a vision of what's uh, next, uh, always being ahead of the curve and creating uh, uh, wines that uh, are now, as you said, uh, Ian, iconic in the world scene. I started with the Tignanello, which is one uh, of the first Super Tuscans ever produced. We created the actual category of Super Tuscans. Um, but this is not really the time to talk about this. What I uh, really want to, to stress is the background of Charvaro. So it's a funny story that I want to share with you, Ian, because this is a story that very few people know. But uh, in 1935, uh, uh, Piero's father, Niccolò Antinori, went uh, to Naples with the sales manager of Antinori, which at the time uh, used to cover the uh, just the north central part of Italy, never been to Naples. 
and they decided that there was a huge market that needed to be pursued. So obviously being a Tuscan company uh, focused on Chianti Classico, they brought all these uh, beautiful red wines. Unfortunately, as uh, most of you may know, uh, Naples is on the sea, so the main consumption is white wines. So everybody was asking for white wines. And uh, eventually, you know, somebody showed, uh, some restaurateur showed a bottle of Rovieto and said, do you have anything like this? And uh, the sales manager, being a very smart guy, said, sure, how uh, many cases you need? And uh, they start getting orders. So at the end of the day, they sold 55 cases of uh, white wines. And uh, Nicolò Antinori turns into the sales manager and he goes, uh, uh, Umberto, um, I'm very glad that you're very aggressive on selling the wine. And, but uh, where are we going to find it? He said, well, that's not my job. My job is to sell it. Your job is to produce it. So <laughs> here we go. Pianotinori goes back to Florence and uh, has all these orders of white wine that uh, he doesn't produce. So goes down to Orvieto. Sees the beautiful property that was already uh, producing some Orvieto wines. So Orvieto is one actually of the oldest uh, wine appellation of Italy. Uh, it's a wine made uh, mainly with the Trebbiano grape. And uh, he decided that uh, it's a the great opportunity to actually get into the white wine business. And, you know, the Antinori were only producing reds. The Chianti is a red wine country. So he purchased this beautiful castle that dates back in the 1300s, uh, which is called Castello della Sala. Castello's castle, Sala, is the name of the family that uh, eventually owned the property in the 1400s. But in the 1300s, here's the other interesting thing, which is a kind of an Italian saga. Um, uh, was owned by the Monaldesca family. And the Monaldesca family um, eventually split in four branches. Uh, they were fighting all the time and they decided to um, um, uh, take ways to uh, be, be apart from each other. And um, at the time, it was very common to choose an animal as part of the crest. So each branch of the family chose a different animal. Uh, one branch of the family chose a dog. Another branch of the family chose uh, a hawk. The other branch of the family chose a viper. And the family that eventually took over the castle chose a stag, uh, or, or I guess a deer. I believe that a stag is only an American deer, correct? Ian, tell me if I'm wrong. I, I, I... Somebody... Somebody told me that the stag doesn't exist in Europe, it only exists in America. So I, I use the term uh, stag just to make it uh, understandable for our American friends, but uh, it would be a, in Italy, it would be basically the deer. And um, uh, eventually, as a typical at that time, uh, to make peace, uh, they have uh, the two cousins from the two branches of the family marrying into each other, uh, the viper family and uh, the vipera. And, uh, um, the other branch of the family that eventually was the Cervaro family, and uh, they changed their name into Sala. So uh, they took over the castle they, because of they had the majority, you know, over 50, they had the 50% of the stake there uh, being married to each other, and uh, um, is now part of the name of our property. When in 1940, we inherited, the, well, so sorry, we didn't inherit it, we purchased the property. It was owned by monks um, that um, lived in the property and they planted vineyards. And uh, Pierantino Ori obviously started to produce uh, uh, Orvieto, which is, as I said, one of the most uh, renowned white wines from Italy. And uh, uh, one of the most historical wine regions in Italy. But eventually, uh, and here's the other interesting thing, um, Pierantinori hired, uh, when he got in charge of the property, a uh, very young winemaker called Renzo Cottarella. Renzo Cottarella was uh, a guy born and raised in Orvieto. He took over the property. And then on a trip to Bordeaux, which was organized by a, a mutual friend, I'm sure uh, Ian, you're very familiar with this guy, Daryl Corti from Sacramento. He uh, took a Pierantinori uh, on a business trip to Bordeaux uh, to visit some of the Bordeaux properties. And on the way, they stopped in Burgundy and they ordered a bottle of uh, Batard Montrachet. Uh, what happened that night is that when uh, Pierantinori tasted this wine, he said that to his friend Daryl Corti, which is a very influential person in the wine industry up in Napa Valley, 
um, he said, well, uh, this is a great wine, but we will never be able to um, make this wine, uh, this quality wise. And sure enough, uh, Renzo Cottarella, which at the time was 26, he said, Piero, if you allow me, I would like to try to play Chardonnay, uh, you know, fermented in barrique, like the French do, and see what happens. And uh, Piero Antinori, being as, as young, almost as young as uh, Renzo Cottarella at the time, he was 33, you know, very adventurous guy, say, sure, go ahead. You have a uh, carte blanche, you can do whatever you need uh, to do, and um, let's see what happens. And voilà. sure enough, in that, I'm sorry. I said, et voila. Et voila. Here yeah. is uh, Cervaro <laughs> was born 30... in 90, in so the vintage real. of... Yes. So we got about 30 seconds remaining. So I want to talk about wine here. This wine sure. is, is always impressive. Jeff uh, Costa Bravo um, noted the creaminess in the mouthfeel and the body. Yes, correct. Are we talking about French oak and lee stirring? And um, I mean, you were heading sure. in that direction, obviously, but that, that I just want to answer that question directly. Yeah, so Cervaro was... Uh, the first, uh, apparently, allegedly, uh, obviously there is no uh, uh, scientific documentation on this, but allegedly is the first uh, white wine that ever used the barrique in Italy. Uh, we believe that barrique is a mean to an end, which is uh, allowing the wine to be fermented uh, with the oxygenation and uh, lease steering. In other words, you, lee, you steer the lees in French is called batonnage, um, with the juice uh, to give you the screaminess that uh, uh, you're talking about and uh, is uh, aging barrel only for five months. The idea is to allow some oxygenation into the wine, but not to give too much of oak uh, flavor into the wine. We, we like to keep the identity of the wine pure. We don't want to interfere with the wood. And uh, that's actually one of the main philosophy of the Antinori family, to just to have the wine speak for itself. Not and that, it's, that it's got that just enough itself. butter and energy, but the energy underneath it just continues to revive your palate. And I, I think it's, you know, for a lot of people, they'll say oh. something like, oh, I don't like oaky, buttery Chardonnay. And then you taste this wine and you're like, but I love this one. Yes. And this is this is uh, just like I said, it's one of the great white wines of the world, not just a great Chardonnay and not just a, a great Italian wine. So, Silvio, just a, just a, just a very uh, last note uh, for yeah. people who are interested in the aging of this wine. Uh, believe it or not, this wine uh, would really benefit for at least ten years in the cellar. For people who are interested in that. Yeah, and I I've been in restaurants here recently. Um, uh, that had the 2012, because you guys do a good job, Antonori, of, of, of bringing in a little older library and featuring it in a, some top restaurants. So if you go out to dinner and you're looking at the wine list, you can find this wine. And it's, it's still reasonably priced. This wine is around $70 a bottle on the website. A little light of that and everybody on this zoom tonight has a special discount code that will pretty much make this like the lowest price in the country tonight i'm i'm telling you right now burgundies of this quality are over 125 dollars and up and this wine will in in blind tastings will destroy 125 dollars of bottles of burgundy and in fact napa valley chardonnays are going crazy the top uh, we sent out an email today and i'm looking at my lineup of of california chardonnay's top wines they're all heading north of a hundred dollars a bottle for chardonnay um in sonoma and napa alike 125 is the new starting point for high-end california chardonnay and so this wine is destined to be more expensive and it will it'll continue to go up in price but uh it's been about the same price uh silvio for many many years i i can remember it's been in between around 55 65 75 dollars for a while so this is a great value and um i just wanted to thank you for being here and for kicking off our program um silvio is always a wealth of information and uh it's great to have a friend at antonori and when i went to t uh, tuscany um silvio took great care of me and I got to go to the Antonori facility and have a beautiful experience. So thank you for that, Silvio. And uh, we uh, we would love all of you guys to get to Antonori. So those of you watching 
this Zoom. If you're going on vacation to Italy and you want to go to Antonor, you let me know, and we'll uh, we'll you know we, we love to take care of our stars friends. So uh, please uh, keep that in mind. And Silvio, thank you again. We now head into wine number two. And uh, I think I skipped a slide. There we go. Wine number two. We're going to Sicily. Tosca de Almarita from uh, this is Tenuta Regali. And uh, please improve my Italian pronunciation. Matthew, are you out there? I am. Thank you for having me in. It is Regali Ali. Regali Ali. It's a fun one. <laughs> let, me, uh, let me spotlight you. I'm just going to try to find you real quick if you keep talking. There you are. I found you. All right. Spotlight for everybody. Thank you for joining us and uh, for being on stars. Your picture's um, showing up backwards on my screen. You know what? And I tried flipping it. It's forwards on mine. So I wasn't sure. My apologies. Not a problem. <laughs> But uh, it makes you look at it twice. Um, <laughs> I, I'm going to go into our PowerPoint and we go right into a really cool uh, but concise video um, that uh, allows us to kind of visit the property. And um, Matthew uh, helped me connect with a representative of the winery. And um, I'm not going to say any more. We'll just go right in. And here we go. Good morning from Los Angeles. Uh, pleasure to meet you, Lorenzo Gucci and uh, Matthew Lapidus. Uh, thank you for being here on behalf of the estate. Uh, Lorenzo Gucci. I've heard of Gucci before. <laughs> <laughs> long story. It's a long story, but it's a you know, different, <laughs> different thing. So right now, likely, I'm in wine, and uh, I would love to keep on that <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> <Got> so. <it. laughs> Yeah, well, I appreciate you being here and making time for us thank, today. Thank you, Ian, and thank you for inviting us. Uh, it's been an honor for me of being here and hopefully to be really back soon in L.A., which I, I miss so much. <laughs> so fantastic. Today we're t tasting a wine uh, from Tosca Conte de Amaretti. Did I pronounce that okay? Rosso del Conte. Rosso del Conte is the name of the wine. Exactly. And, and this is the 2015 that we're tasting today. They got 94 points in Robert Parker's Wine Advocate. And uh, you've made some uh, upgrades to the label. So I just want to kind of debut the 2016, what the package is going to look like, um, which is pretty impressive. Pascal Almerita family is the family that owns and run Tenuta Regali Estates. And among Tenuta Regali Ali also uh, a couple of different estates around Sicily. Tenuta Regale Ali is the family home of Tasca family that has been run within uh, um, since 1830, the day that was purchased by the, uh, by the Tasca family. And since then has been run with passion and dedication to agriculture and to native variety of Sicily and to promoting the quality, quality and the large driven wines of Sicily as well. Regale Ali means altitude and the altitude is the attitude of the state as well. Thanks to the different, uh, uh, thanks to the thanks to the microclimates, the different soil composition, about twelve different soils at the Mutare Galeali. The state is about one, one thousand three, one thousand four hundred acres, uh, and wow. thanks to the different microclimates, soils, sun exposure, we can really work in different ways. As you can see, there is a map showing a bit of the vineyards. Uh, we have. At the moment, we are working with 25 different grape variety. The majority of them are native variety of Sicily, and obviously some international variety as well. The main and most important uh, um, grape variety of this particular part of the world, so the central part of Sicily, are two two red red native varieties, and we are talking about Nero d'Avola and Terricone, which are the main uh, main grapes that we use for the Rosso del Conte as well. And the Catarratto for the for a white way uh, for the white grape variety. So three native varieties that are are blend, like, are growing as the majority for Etnotaregaleani. This is the photo. This is a picture of Alberto Tasca, 
uh, in one of the hill of Regale Ali. And as you can see, the landscape is quite spectacular and uh, beautiful <laughs> and definitely a place that you have to visit and to experience in order to really understand what Regale Ali means to us. That is home. The wine that we're tasting today is a blend of uh, Nero d'Avla and Perricone. Perricone. Perricone is uh, probably among, like Nero d'Avola, was among one of the historical and most planted variety, red variety uh, of Italy, of Italy, I'm sorry, of Sicily. But during the phylloxera, the Perricone was down zone a lot due to the fact that it was not grafting really well on the American roots. So one of the focus of the Tascadal Medita family is always, has always been committed to uh, promote the native variety of Sicily. And obviously we had to uh, bring out there again uh, and really power, like really implement the activity with the Perricone as well. So we decided to, to work with these grapes. Uh, actually, um, Rosso del Conte is among one of the historical wine of, of the state. I mean, is one of the first single, is the first single vineyard wine created at the Mutare Galeali. Uh, the wine has been released in 19, in the early 70s, so we are talking about many years ago, and for Sicilian viticulture, probably a way in advance uh, compared to many others, uh, like, mm, I mean, full wines or single vineyard wines. It's an assemblage of Perricone Nero Davola and is growing as bush system, so as a, a the classic Alberello, fermented in steel and steel, released after an aging in, in oak, in new oak, French, Allier and Troncoise for about 18 months and 18 months in the bottle. So it's a really nice expression of an aerodavola and pericone assemblage that should develop over time. Really young, in the, like right now, or obviously with a lot of, of the developing the bottle needed as well. So this is another picture as well. Matthew and I are about to taste this wine. You know, you really get a sense when you smell this wine uh, of the surrounding and you can smell the, the chaparral and the, the beautiful landscape and these dramatic photos that just really take you into the heart of Sicily and show you this beautiful that... farm, beautiful. Well, it's a spectacular wine. I was introduced to it uh, a while back and um, I, I'm very fortunate to have it into our stars of Italian wine lineup tonight and uh, I'm very proudly have a few wines from your estate on our a Merchant of Wine website and maybe when you're in uh, Los Angeles Lorenzo we can do something uh, significant uh, in person. I will definitely, I mean, I will not say yes now because I, I'm not the boss over there, but <laughs> definitely, definitely, I mean, anytime. I, I, I love California, I love LA, so I mean, it would be fantastic and terrific. Anytime, one. Anytime. Once again. Ciao. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. So that was really fun for me to be able to spend a minute with Lorenzo Gucci. Um, I don't know if anybody saw House of Gucci, but a really cool movie. Um, I, th I thought it was fantastic, by the way. I, for, I loved the movie. And um, it was captivating and really, really, uh, really awesome. Um, great cast, too. Come on. Al Pacino? Are you kidding? That was amazing. You got, if you haven't checked out House of Gucci yet, definitely do yourself a favor and, and watch it. Um, it also, you know, shows uh, a classic crisis of, uh, you know, Italian families and, and the story. It felt, felt almost perfect with Pacino because of The Godfather and everything else. Well, the wine is really cool, really fun, um, a Sicilian classic um, and delicious and dense. It's got a great mouthfeel. It's so good with food. Uh, different foods. We're tasting the 2015, um, which is awesome to be able to have something with a little bit of age. And I want to thank Matthew for having this wine available for us and uh, being able to be on the stars and getting a Gucci member uh, mm -hmm. to represent the brand. Thank you, Ian. And yeah, I, I appreciate the comments on this wine. Uh, I've only been able to represent this producer for three months. 
Uh, so I'm relatively new to it, uh, but I think you nailed it. It's that weightiness and the mouthfeel and the texture that comes right out of the bottle as a young wine. Uh, and it is, it's deep and a little musty and it's definitely an unctuous uh, style. I, I might go more of like a cigar tobacco for that deep musty flavor. Um, but again, I, I like the comments, so thank you guys. And I hope you enjoy the wine as much as I do. Yeah, it, it's got just a little kiss of like uh, a balsamic edge to it. It's got a, a little wildness, a little gaminess, a little uh, leather bound books. I mean, it smells like all those great things. And um, I think it's, it's really fun to get kind of lost in this wine. And this wine changes a lot and it will age for a really nice long time as well. And so uh, a really fun fun wine to have in the lineup and certainly one of the, the icons of Sicily. Um, and this estate is just tremendous. So I'm gonna try next year to put a group together to go to go with me to Sicily. So uh, be thinking about that and we'll, we'll head there uh, potentially in March of next year. Uh, so you might want to plan into that a little bit and we'll, uh, we'll start soliciting, uh, for people to join us. We'd love to host you guys. We have uh, a little accommodation at the winery as well. Um, nice. so yeah, let's keep, All right. conversation going. We'll, we'll keep that conversation going. Thousand acre estate in the center of Sicily. That sounds pretty good to me. <laughs> All right, Matthew, thank you so much for your time, sir. Have a good night and enjoy the rest of the program. We are now going to go uh, in Tuscany and we're going to head to Montalcino. Ben, did you find your way onto the Zoom? I am here. All right. Let's keep talking to me so I can find you. Oh, okay. Uh, hi, Matt. It's good there to you see are. you. <laughs> hi, Dominique. There, you go, ben. <laughs> there we go. Hi, Ben. Hi. The last time I saw you on Zoom with me, you were on your back because you hurt your back or something. Yeah. You look a lot that, better. That, that was when I got hit by a car on my bicycle, yes. Yeah, okay. Well, that would explain it. You, you look like you're uh, upright and doing pretty well now. I am. I'm doing great. Cool. Uh, and Peloton, you don't, you stay out of traffic on those? Yeah, things? yeah. No, there's no more uh, uh, <laughs> bicycling around Koreatown. Let's just say that. Mm. Well, we're, I'm going to pour this uh, beauty in the glass. And, you know, when I put these stars line up, line ups together, there's a lot of things I'm, I'm working on and ideas I'm working through. And this is a brand that I, I was introduced to a few years back. I've been to Montalcino probably a dozen times over the life of my, my career. And uh, I, this was a newer uh, brand to Montalcino, but I got introduced a couple of years back. I met Sebastian here in LA. We started talking. This is a really phenomenal, Sebastian's the winemaker and he's uh, super passionate um, about his biodynamics and um, the family behind this brand, Illy Cafe. Um, one of the founders of Illy Cafe gave him basically carte blanche to kind of run with a lot of his his ideas and they built a, an amazing facility and uh let's get into the the powerpoint and we'll show the video i also just got to go uh to um excuse me for one second there we go oh ben i just got to interrupt for a second if you guys got a t-shirt tonight it's from tosca um, and we want to thank them for the t-shirts. They don't look like that, but uh, the men's shirts just arrived today. We sent out uh, women's shirts. And so any orders that are received tonight with Italian wines from this Zoom will receive a men's shirt. And I've got a large assortment of sizes, but the, the extra large isn't all that extra large. It'll, it'll make you look uh, very Gucci-like. So uh, it's, it's gonna slimming effect on, on the uh, extra large. So um, I, I can't really promise sizes, but if you put a comment in there that you're super small, I'll try to find something like that for you. Um, 
but uh, any orders tonight, we'll get another shirt because we got we got some nice shirts from um, from Tosca, and the men's shirts just arrived today. Okay, Ben, back to you, and we are now talking about Podera La Rippi. This is Montalcino, and it, this uh, wine that we're tasting tonight is not a Brunello de Montalcino; it is a Rosso. But the story and the reason I was so drawn to this wine to tell to share it tonight is that this brand has been working to elevate Rosso from the very beginning. Um, not all Rosso de Montalcinos are going to be alike. And I think you're going to see this one's a, a couple of steps ahead of other Rosos that you may have tried. So Ben, I have this video that I shot. I think this is the one that uh, let gets me right in with Sebastian. Let's see. Yeah. Good morning from Los Angeles, Sebastian. Sebastian Nazello, the winemaker. Hello, John. Ciao. <laughs> Good to see you. I was able to visit you at Podero La Ripi. Uh, yeah. It's definitely an ambitious project, and let's show people what we're talking about as we enter into our. Brunello, Montalcino, and the Rosso de Montalcino that we're going to be tasting today. We're tasting from the 16 vintage, a great vintage. Yep. That's a special wine, especially because uh, Rosso de Montalcino normally is a wine released very, very young without any particular refinement. Uh, this Rosso in particular, like all our Rosso de Montalcino, age in the big cask for three sometimes four years very similar to brunello and uh, same sangiovese grape but released with the name of rosso di montalcino yeah when i was introduced to your brand i was told that you're elevating the category of rosso uh and so i've been following that and saw the opportunity to pick up this 2016. yep the idea is offering uh, some Sangiovese with a very, very clear sense of place. Well, let's, let's take a look at the place. And I think I just clicked too far. There we go. This is a aerial view. Yeah. And when you arrived, none of this was here really, right? Yeah, it was just a simple farmhouse with a sheep and uh, we did in, in olive trees, of course. We, we did all our, our own vineyard, and uh, and now we have the animals, and uh, let's say it's, it's Montalcino had this uh, landscape where vineyards are integrated in the local vegetation, in the natural landscape. Well, I was standing right there looking out over this beautiful vista and really uh, fell in love with it, and you're sitting there right now. Does it... Uh, does it seem kind of surreal that you're, I mean, you probably get used to it, but it is such, it's like one of the most beautiful places on the planet. It really is. Thank you. And the, the, the focus of integrating a, a sense of place, sustainability. We, we always say that we borrow our land from, uh, from, from the ancestors and that uh, we will make this land uh, livable for for our sons and for the next generation but preserving the, ferti the fertility as we look at the the area known as Montalcino, um it, there's there's something to take and to appreciate uh, uh here is the way that the the area is divided and the thoughts about the east and the west and the north and the south and some of the characteristics that come from the different subsets, different uh, um, you know, soils, different exposures, different levels of water. Now you're 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 sitting over here by is it? Are you yep. two hundred four? Yeah, we we are based on the southeast corner, and uh, but we cultivate vineyard on the two side of Montalcino, west and east. The yep. wine that you're going to taste is from west. And he's facing the sunset. Excellent. Yeah, it's a small story of what happened in our farm during a full time, and um, 
Okay, we it's uh, we are completely uh, immersed in the in the seasonal life. There are different things that we do in according of the the, the weather and the season and different food that we eat and different uh, way to to wear. Uh, it's, it's it's like living four different places in the same year. The facility itself was built with some very high ethos and um, uh, you are uh, certified biodynamic? Yeah, from 2011 we move in a biodynamic way in farming and uh, also organic of course and um, it's, it's a nice tool to work on the biological life in the soil and around the plants and uh, it's very for me, very suitable for our purpose to make pure wine without interference and without, let's say, forcing the wine to accomplish some taste, but more searching for local sense of place. <laughs> That's so cool. So there's just so much to cover, Sebastian. Uh, your your adventure has only just begun. Um, you have incredible ownership. Yeah. Um, what What is the owner's name? Francesco Francesco Illi came from the coffee industry, and in '97 he purchased the the farmhouse and he did the first vineyard. It's a it's, it's a nice place to discover new things. Why you never stop to learn? Well, thank you for allowing us uh, <laughs> a moment with you. And you're, you're a rising star personality, and uh, I, I know that your passion runs through the okay, yeah, It's been a pleasure. We'll talk to you soon, my friend. Bye. Ciao. Well, that is uh, Sebastian and Benjamin. Thank you for setting me up uh, with a, a, a fantastic appointment there. Um, and being able to meet him here in LA and then see him in uh, there, right there in the vineyard, uh, was literally um, standing there with the little birds and the sheep walking by me, and and uh, was standing in a vineyard called Bonsai, and it's a high density planted vineyard right next to the organic farms, and they make a wine on this property called Bonsai that doesn't even care about the rules of Brunello di Montalcino, but it's a hundred point wine, right made right here on the property, all Sangiovese grown biodynamic and super teeny little plants because the spatial, spatially you couldn't put plants any closer together. Yeah, the, the rules in uh, Montalcino to be able to grow Brunello, you have to have 4,500 plants in a hectare, which is about 2.2 .2 acres or less. In the Bonsai Vineyard, they planted 64,000. Um, they, uh, everyone told them they were crazy and, but they wanted to see what would happen. It's basically a way of making your, your vines struggle and produce less fruit, kind of like old vines do. Um, everyone told them they were crazy. At one point they had to dig up, uh, an old dead oak tree that was right next to the vineyard. And what they discovered is the vines had dug themselves in two years, over five meters deep for the roots. They, at this point, they go way deeper than that into the mountain. Um, and most of the vines survived. You know, they just struggle and fight each other. And you get this one bunch or two bunches at the most from each plant. Um, technically, it's a Rosso or an IGT uh, for the bonsai wine. We also only get 30 bottles for the U.S. every, every vintage. And I'm going to get a couple of those. Are they, are they here yet? They're, they're in stock. Uh, I have seven of them for you if you want them. I'll send them now. I okay. Them. Yeah. And uh, the this this is really cool stuff. It's not inexpensive, but it's one of the greatest expressions. And it'll be a long investment for us as a company to get these wines and put them in our library um, if any of you are interested in, in, in pursuing a bottle of bonsai, give me a chat. But um, it, it's uh, take a uh, search for it, 
and you'll you'll see what I'm talking about. But tonight we're tasting the Rosso, which I only have about a dozen bottles of. Um, this is just an outstanding bottle of wine. It's got great ageability. We um, have more in stock, Ian. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Cool. So more of the 16? More of the 16, and then we'll move on to the 18. All right. Well, cool. Well, um, uh, buy up what I have, and we'll get some more, because 16 is an awesome vintage. Um, I mean, it is, uh, you know, if you measured every vintage in Montalcino history, uh, this would be at the top. Yeah. And, um, and so you can't have too many of these in your cellar. The, the, the ageability prospect of this wine is, is amazing. But look at how they're drinking now. I'm sure people are tasting this wine and really going, whoa. Um, and yeah, they do make uh, Brunello di Montalcino as well. That's also fantastic. But uh, to be able to have a bottle of wine like this, it's around $40 on the website. Um, it's, it's really a tremendous bottle of wine and it's a great story how they're elevating Rosso. I'm sure other Rosso's yeah. are 25 to $30, but this one is so much better and so much, it got so much more potential. And the, the fact that they're, you're selling the 16 now and a lot of Rosso's I'm seeing on the marketplace are 19s already, you know, that's yeah, the, it, They really what what i like to stress most about this wine is they really are making a rosso just like a brunello and calling it rosso you are really getting a brunello at that price and it's utterly amazing what you're getting yeah so um and this is not a big brand this is a small brand it's an artisan brand and uh they are Go, definitely going to be known for their artisanship, their biodynamics, their relentlessness uh, when it comes to making wines with this biodynamic ethos system. That facility there, by the way, um, it goes down about uh, 30 feet and or maybe meters. Yeah, 30 meters. Thank you. Yeah. super deep into the mountain and so you start at the top and it spirals all the way down inside all naturally cooled um beautiful uh like duom domo type of architecture with natural light it's it, 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 it took them 12 years to build that they, they actually had there's no metal in that building they built it just like they used to build it thousands of years ago so again, if you want to go someplace really cool, the hospitality here is awesome. They make all the food from their garden. They have a, it's not quite a restaurant, but it's kind of like a pairing option that you could go there and do a flight of wines with lunch or an, uh, um, some sort of, a, you know, it's an option. It's like a menu of a selection that you can make when you're visiting. Um, and it's a super small, but very intimate team, very knowledgeable. The team has all been there for years now, and they they basically are kind of giving their life to this property and, uh, you know, just thriving because of it. So I love the project. I love the wine. Um, it is a more expensive Rosso, but it's not an, it's an inexpensive Brunello, and it's really uh just a great story in the making. And Ben, thank you for sharing the wine with us. Does anybody have any questions for Ben? Uh, I haven't asked it, you guys, if you want to take yourself off mute and ask Ben, you can do that. Well, Ben, there's, you left him speechless. There you go. I hope it was yeah, the no, wine yeah, and not me that left him speechless. <laughs> It was great, man. The wine is beautiful, fantastic, and I thank you. My pleasure. We're going to continue our journey. We're still in Tuscany, and we are going to now go to another, uh, you know, I get to kind of pick from my favorite children which one, which wines to put into the showcase. And um, so now we're going to taste with uh, Davide. And let me let me uh, remove the spotlight there. I'm gonna stop the share for a second. Find Davide out there. I know you're there, Davide. I'm here. Yes, I'm be on the first row the whole evening. Got you. Always, got you. 
next to your screen. So, <laughs> thank you. How you doing? Doing fine. I just realized that my screen is a little foggy. Um, hopefully, works fine for you for your end. You sound good. That's all that matters. Okay. Yeah. Let me uh, not share my my scary screen. Let me just share the video. There we go. All right. Let's go with. Uh, now, I uh, need to start off by saying, you know, some of these wines I've had a relationship with for a long time. And Avionese I sold back in the 1990s when I worked at Young's Market. Um, and uh, it was kind of a, a star back then. And, you know, that certainly the Tuscan movement has produced a lot of stars. So there's a lot of noise coming out of Tuscany. And Avionese is a small brand, so it's it's fighting to remind people just how great it is. Um, and uh, you walked into the, my life at just the right moment to be able to think about this. And I have a, a rule on my website not to carry more than one wine per brand just because it's uh, there's so many wines to buy. But I actually carry four wines from Avionese. And um, I, I, I can't always say I'll do that, but... Uh, uh, this is a really, really fun project, and uh, Davide set me up with a, a, a Zoom with the ownership. So let's start there, Davide. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, I am so pleased to be able to introduce you to Maximilian Desrovi. Uh, he is a, a partner owner of uh, Avionesi, and uh, I'm, uh, I'm talking to you today. You are in Tuscany, Max. Yeah, the sun set, uh, set something like 10 minutes ago, so, you know, a different time. Excellent. As you can see, there is still some daylight here, but very little. Very nice, very nice. You got vines right outside the window. Mm -hmm. uh, it's 2022. Uh, are you in bud break at this time? Not really yet. I mean, in certain areas a little bit, but I mean, nothing, nothing really significant at the moment. Max, tell us about Avionese. What drew you to this property? Well, that's a good question. Um, I usually reply, um, uh, we did it by mistake, um, which I think is probably the best, uh, the true the true answer. Um, we, um, uh, Virginie wanted to, uh, this is the old dream, she wanted to, uh, you know, uh, run a wine business and she had the opportunity to, to be a silent partner in Avionese way back. And, you know, it takes time. It took us about, I would say, 10 to 12 years to be able to, I would say, turn this winery into something which we can be proud of. And we're getting at this stage now. I mean, you know, you can't do that faster than in 10 years. I mean, it's impossible. Beautiful. And uh, we now have, Davide, four different SKUs. Uh, and you're one of the few wine in my store I usually carry one per brand, but I love what you're doing and I tasted through the wines and the, the wines are so pure and super focused and made with a really beautiful texture and character and typicity and all those wonderful things. And uh, I'm, I'm just hoping that more people will start to connect with brands like yours and seek them out because of what you just out laid out. I appreciate your words. Thank you very much. I would not praise my wine because I would be, I wouldn't be objective. Um, but it's good that you talk about it. You will realize that in my speech, I never mentioned it. <laughs> and uh, I, I can tell you're a man of. Uh, of passion and a, a concern and uh and your writing to me too i i really appreciated all the detail and information and again thank you for the nice words you say about our wines and our denomination and you know i like to say that unfortunately the vino nobile is a little bit forgotten in america in the united states it's been uh, you know squeezed between the rock and the hard place. Uh, the rock, because we have our neighbors of Brunello, which for plenty of reasons, you know, have taken the leadership in terms of Tuscan wine in uh, in America. And 
I'm a keen Brunello drinker. Believe me, I love that. <laughs> so I'm certainly not complaining about it. But the, the other side, we have the namesake of Montepulciano d'Abruzzo, which is also creating a confusion in people's minds. So our denomination, away. <laughs> <laughs> so our denomination has been a little bit blurred in, in, in America and sometimes even, you know, misperceived. I think it's, it's unfair, but it's not your fault. It's because we have not been able to communicate properly. And, and, and definitely I appreciate this occasion, this occasion. I like to, uh, recall, like history recalls, that uh, the Nobile is the mother of all Tuscan fine wines. It's been on for something like half a millennium, 500 years since the Renaissance, perhaps 600 years now. And it and it's called Nobile because it was actually for the nobles. It was really the high class wine. Uh, and also we have to say that uh, Montepulciano, where we are, is the cradle of the Grand Sangiovese historically. Yeah. And your uh, most famous uh, wine lover and president, Thomas Jefferson, was the king drinker of Nobile Montepulciano in the, in the, uh, at the end of the 18th century and begin, beginning of the 19th century. And he was a connoisseur, as you can imagine, because he'd been in Paris for a while uh, at Versailles. And he was a, a, a lover of French wines, but his favorite wine was actually a Tuscan wine and it was Nobile. Beautiful. Well, I, I know that the history runs deep and there's so much to take into consideration. Um, and you are stuck in that rock, in, in the, between a rock and a hard place, but that but that that cavus that you're in seems to be spreading out and allowing people to really see it, um, especially as price points, you know, go north and there's separation, there's clarity. And, uh, and I think that the future is very bright. Thank you. Well, Thank you, gentlemen. Thank pleasure. you for your time. My Thank pleasure, you. mine. All right. We'll see you, you guys. In, uh, Tuscany. <laughs> oh, okay. yes. Welcome. Uh, Bye. You talk. Thank you, Max. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you David. Bye-bye. Ciao. Ciao. We chopped that up a little bit too harshly, Davide. There is a full version of that video on the website, but we, we talked for about 25 minutes. And, uh, well, we chopped it because we never talked about the Desiderio, which is a Merlot, but... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. Uh, and... We, we will uh, now cover that a little bit more, um, you and I together. Yeah. Well, first of all, I mean, Max and Virginie, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's an amazing story. I don't want to get into the details of what brought them to Montalcino initially and then eventually to Avignonesi. But uh, um, they are both lawyer by trade. I mean, they went back to once they realized that they... they uh, were buying Avignonese, um, they kind of went, he said it, he went back to college uh, in Bordeaux and they, they studied, you know, enology, viticulture and all that. Uh, they were already 50 years old. But uh, anyhow, they're very interesting. They're very passionate. Uh, Virginie is, uh, she grew up with wine, um, mostly French wine, Burgundy, um, um, in the majority. And, uh, and I find a relationship between uh, her um, love for Burgundy and the way our Vino Nobile, project, the single vineyards, the Grand Annate drinks. There is a lot of finesse that is looking uh, in, uh, from San Giovese. But um, we're talking about, uh, you know, Desiderio, which is uh, Merlot. And, um, and uh, it's, it's a great, uh, you know, breaking out from uh, the usual, I mean, we are not the only one producing Merlot in Tuscany, but, uh, you know, um, in the area, um, um, it's, it's kind of uh, um, um, not unique, but uh, in, in a way it is. Um, also the story well, behind this wine. So you probably first, show. Yeah, go ahead. It's, 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 it's a pure Merlot, which is unique, actually. There's only a couple in Tuscany that play the pure play on, on Merlot, 
and this is a pretty famous one. You've been doing it for a long time. Desiderio isn't always the one that people think of first, but I just drew a line to show you the continuity in Tuscany to uh, the thread that kind of strings along from Bulgari where you have wines like Ornalaya, uh, who makes Masetto, and then you've got uh, Maltocino, and then you've got uh, this place called Maltopucciano. And uh, so a Merlot from this area is just really, really uh, um, special, and it is unique, but it's also been a part of the property story for a very long time. It's not made because it's trendy or the, you know, uh, and they haven't given up on, on Merlot. In fact, Tuscan Merlots are probably, have, have, people don't even recognize that, that this is a Merlot in the, in the world of wine. This is Desiderio, it's Avionese, and it's a great wine. Um, and then you get into it and you see the expression that it is. It's so pretty, so stacked, so beautiful. And I saw some wonderful tasting notes there. Uh, the, the sea salt, uh, a kiss of balsamic, so yeah. so pure, so so much uh, finesse, so much style. As I'm t t tasting it and talking about it, it's just, it's getting even more impressive. Um, and we're we're showing off 2016 again. Really, an awesome vintage in Tuscany, and uh, not every vintage is awesome, um, uh, but 16 is. And uh, this is a wine that will age a decade or more. Um, and uh, I think you'd have a hard time holding it. You'd want to pop it open and drink it um, now in its eighth year. And to be able to buy something that has this kind of style and quality and character at this price point is a real value proposition. Um, not, it's not an everyday wine, but it is a great wine that you can pull out and pour uh, and make every any meal uh, special and it doesn't it certainly that what I love about this wine too this isn't like you have to be eating Italian you could be eating steak and you could be eating any game you know yeah lamb I mean it's you can go many ways you know to drink this uh, wine and um, well I wanted to say something about the name Desiderio where it comes from so when the Avignonese of course Virginie um, go part of the establishment uh, 2006 2005 and then she finalized the purchase of uh, Avignonese in 2009 but Avignonese as a as a winery has a long uh, previous history started in, in 1970. So Desiderio, um, it's a wine that has been made since 1985, I believe. And when they decided to make it, uh, they didn't plant uh, Merlot just for the sake of it. But as you mentioned earlier on, since uh, most of the fruit comes from La Selva, uh, which is a property, uh, one of our property in the Cortona area. So we are outside the Monte Pucciano oh. DOCG appellation. French varieties have been grown there for the last 200 years. Because a, um, a gentleman by the name of, of Napoleon conquered the whole Italy, and then some soldiers stayed behind, became farmers. And they found the right uh, microclimate, like soil the right soil composition to grow French varieties. In fact, uh, there is a big uh, Syrah DOC in the air. But the, the other thing, and then, uh, um, we can, uh, I can stop talking, is I just wanted to talk about the name, Desiderio. Desiderio was a, a real Canina bull, Canina breed bull that lived 150 years ago and was owned by the Avignonesi. So the Avignonesi go back to the 13, 1200. They were the local landlord, aristocrat, they own it all. And then eventually started selling plots. And, uh, but they are still there. The family is still there. And uh, so Desiderio was uh, a bull, a 3,600 pounds Chianina bull. You can imagine the beast. And then uh, it was owned by the Avignonesi and all the other farmers in the area were asking to borrow the bull, okay? Who they eventually went by the name of Desiderio because it was the desire of all the other uh, farmers to meet with their local, you know, um, um, cow. So, um, so 
So the story is that this bull has defined the canina um, breeds, cow breed, uh, to a point that there are, there are some study in there, studies there, and then if you eat the Bistecca la Fiorentina, the Florentine steak today, you're gonna find these genes. So when he came to um, make a, a, a Merlot, uh, the, the name went along. I mean, it had to be called Desiderio, the desire. Um, so we are certified biodynamic since 2019. Um, um, so uh, 2016, we have been certified, since 2016, we have been certified organic. So a lot of effort by Virginia, her team to, you know, to, to create wines as natural as possible. Well, I know that uh, back in the day when I was selling these wines, Merlot was on fire in sales back in the 1990s. It's coming back. It is. It is because it's, well, it's basically been eradicated. So the little, the few producers that are still making it are some of the top and they had the top vineyards. And then now it is coming back because everything that's Cabernet is uh, $200 a bottle and up. And Merlot has just kind of been idling there, waiting for people. And they're like giving it another look. And it's certainly coming back in a big way. And here's a picture of Virginie, by the way. Yeah. Virginie? Virginie. Virginie, yes. Virginie. And um, so, and the, 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 there's other wines that the property makes too. One's called 50-50. And that was always impossible to get. So these wines were always highly desirable. And uh, Davide is kind of tasked with kind of bringing them back to greatness because the the brand kind of didn't have, I mean, it was selling on its own. And so they pulled out all, all the salespeople and they just let the brand kind of float. And uh, then uh, the new ownership took over. And I knew the old ownership. They're great people. They moved to the south southern part of Italy and built a biodynamic farm down there and let this family take over the Avenacy brand. Uh, but this is, a this is a, one of the great stories in Tuscany and Davide is attached with telling it and Davide, thank you for, uh, being such a good ambassador and tasting with me, you know, all the great wines and open up the library and being able to show something great like this. Thank you, Ian. All the wines show great. I mean, I really appreciate the way you're able to send, uh, these little bottles and maintain all the fragrance of the wines, uh, the texture. So, I mean, you, you, you're doing a great job. Absolutely. Thanks, man. And I, yeah. I, I love the way they show with, uh, it's like a, a nice micro oxygenation decanter for two days. We poured them on Monday. It's unbelievable. I just uh, found some nuances of my Merlot that uh, I generally, I don't get there because I open it. I like to open my wine on the morning, take, try it during the day. I don't wait you know, longer, I should wait longer because some uh, that uh, cassis uh, is so pretty, that uh, pine tree. I mean, it's very remarkable the way the wine developed in the, the little bottle. Awesome, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. And uh, I wanna point out too, that uh, all of our representatives tonight, including myself have no hair. So uh, very cool. <laughs> <laughs> Silvio, <laughs> Benjamin, uh, Matthew, did you have hair? I don't even remember. Maybe you did. Maybe Matthew had hair. Is the stress of selling wine? Uh, yeah. We just have, uh, you know, other things to pay attention to. Right. John, John agrees with me, right? <laughs> awesome, John. Thanks for your comments on the chat. We've got uh, one more great wine to share. Ian, I'm afraid uh, you, you break the trend, my friend. You still have some hair. It's looking good, though, I think, right? Davide, <laughs> what do you think of the hair? I think you should lose it, dude. <laughs> all right. We'll do, we'll do a shaving <laughs> for charity. Uh, okay. All right. Cool. Ian, thanks for being here. Davide, thank you. Thanks for uh, having me. Uh, I met Ian when he was running the... Uh, the Magic Castle. And uh, did you hear that Magic Castle just sold? I did. I heard about that. It was interesting. 
yeah, cool. They're going to they're gonna spend some money and uh, invest in the property and build like a mini hotel. And ho hopefully that means, uh, uh, you know, the, even better food. <laughs> but, the, but the chef that was there when uh, when in the last year when I was there was really, really amazing. Or was it two years ago? Um, he was doing really good stuff. I'm not sure if he's still the chef, but the food had absolutely uh, increased in quality already. So um, kudos to him. How are you doing, Ian? I'm doing great. It's just been uh, been nice and busy and getting to taste some great uh, Italian wines tonight to, uh, is a great way to wrap up the week. Well, um, I, I praise all the wines tonight, but I have to layer another um, layer of praise on the wine that we're about to taste. You know, every year you start to pick some of your favorite wines of the year. And uh, this Paolo Scavino Barolo 2017 is currently in my very short list of top wines of the year already. Um, this is a... Uh, 2017 is um, not going down in history as one of the great vintages in Barolo, but quite honestly, uh, the wines are really showy, and that's um, not always the case for Barolo. Barolos tend to require you to like buy them and forget about them for about a decade, and I would challenge you to not want to open this bottle up and and enjoy it in the near term. Um, and the reasons why I, I, uh, I, I'm going to really lavish some heavy praise on this wine isn't because it's the greatest Barolo that I've ever had, but it this wine sells for around 50 bucks and there are uh, Barolos of this quality sell for $100, not 50 bucks. So this is a great deal and a great value. And it's one of the many great wines. I'm just going to segue into a commercial here for a second because we got the call to promote an event that Tuscan, uh, that uh, Italy organized two years ago. They had this whole thing planned for the year 2000. And so when they got the green light to come to America, they came to Los Angeles and New York in a hurry. So uh, this is a BBWO, Barolo and Barbaresco world opening. It's on April 30th. It's going to be at the Intercontinental Hotel. 140 producers are going to be there showing over 200 wines. Tickets are only $125. Um, and I say it that way because they their expense per ticket is over two hundred and fifty dollars so the the italian government is subsidizing this hoping to stimulate barolo and barbaresco sales in the marketplace the food is going to be ridiculous they've got all these dop foods cheeses and pastas and stations being planned um i would i would uh it is considered the largest a tasting dedicated to Barolo and Barbaresco, um, and uh, the, the the chance to taste all these great producers. Go to the website, check out the list of the producers, and grab a ticket. There's less than a hundred tickets left, and um, I would uh, encourage you to plan on being there. Now back to our regular scheduled program with Ian Pritchard, representing Paolo Scavino, and Ian. We don't have a video from Paolo Scavino, because unfortunately, Paolo Scavino uh, is not doing well um, health-wise. And his family has been taking care of him for the last couple of weeks. Um, we don't think the prognosis is very good for Mr. Scavino, um, who's quite old, and his family's been take nursing him uh, through some very difficult times. And so uh, you get the heavy burden of representing the brand with me. And we're just, we've got a little slideshow just to remind people about where Barolo and Barbaresco are located in Piedmont. We're in Northwest Italy, um, and right up against the French border. In fact, the Dukes of Burgundy controlled this area uh, longer than it's been part of Italy. And so it feels a lot like France when you're visiting little parts of uh, Piedmont, uh, uh, Aquaterme, and th towns like that. 
uh, with the aquifers and the towns. It'll feel just like a French town. Um, and then you talk about Barolo itself and the way it's made, and then you taste it. It's very comparable often to Burgundy. Um, in fact, I love to do tastings, Burgundy versus Barolo. Um, and it kind of blows people away because they get the wines wrong all the time. Oh, that's Burgundy. Oh, that's Barolo. And they're wrong. Um, it it, it, it may, may appear a little bit more obvious here in this situation with the young wines. But as they age, the the, the, the dense, the, the mountains of these wines kind of come out and they become very pretty. They have amazing texture, acidity. The color kind of falls out, kind of like Burgundy. Becomes kind of light. Uh, Barolo made from Nebbiolo grape. Um, a really special um, appellation. Might have to stop the share for a second to get that slide to change. Give me one sec. And I'm going to go into a little more detail here and show you uh, the, the Barolo map. And you talk about the little communes inside of Barolo, kind of like Burgundy. You've got to Barolo and Novello and Monforte de Alba and Saralunga de Alba, Castiglione, Folletto, and other areas. La Mora being kind of the prime zone. And if you want to go to Piedmont, we just went. I, I have some great recommendations for you. Um, this is the land of tar and roses. The, the smells that you'll, you'll smell in the wines of Nebbiolo, grown on hillsides at elevation. Um, these wines are just beautiful and, uh, and unrelenting, typically. But here we've got uh, really... Um, sorry, I have to keep doing this share unshared because the slides aren't moving. But um, we're talking about Nebbiolo being aged for a long period of time in these large casks. And the slow oxygenation uh, really slows down the advancement of the wine. And then you put it in the bottle and it slows down the advancement of the wine. And you know, current vintages are typically right now, 2017's moving into 2018's. Um, We've had an incredible run of great, great vintages to choose from. And even in tough vintages, and 17 is not a bad vintage by any means, but 15 and 16 were so good that it's kind of like, oh, 17. Well, then you taste the 17s. And they're exciting. They're rich. They're, they're robust. They've got this flash in them because it was a very dry year, a very warm year. And they, they show it. Um, and so there's just a lot to talk about, Ian, with when it comes to Barolo. Now, the producer, uh, Paolo Scavino, is if you listed the top producers of Barolo and you left the name Paolo Scavino off of the list, you'd be making a mistake. This is a really important producer. And Paolo Scavino himself has been involved with the production of these wines since I think he took over the winemaking in the 1960s. And uh, at that time they were blending all the wines together and uh, and they, they called them Barolo. Uh, they didn't start to singularly pull the vineyards out and start to name the vineyards until the 1980s. And uh, it wasn't until the 1990s that these wines really rocketed uh, to fame and, and, and the prices started to lift. Um, they are still, you know, in the, in the context of the world of wine, um, they've come up in price a lot, but they're still a relative value for what they are. Uh, they, this is a lifetime wine. This is a wine you can buy now, you can drink anytime you want from now until the end of days. Uh, I drink Barolos from the 1960s whenever I can. They're amazing. The 70s, the 80s, the 90s, they really um, are a forever type of a wine if it says Barolo.
I got to keep going in and out of that screen. It's kind of a pain, sorry. But I'm trying to click it forward and it won't move. I might be done now. Ian, do you have the wine in the glass? Right in front of me. All right. What are you thinking of it? I'm just loving the, the deep, rich, kind of dark cherry fruit that I'm getting off of it. Um, I'd love to hear some comments from uh, from some. I see Davide, such a floral Barolo, very charming. Yeah, I agree. And it's got that. Uh, and when they talk about tar and roses, it's almost like you just pulled the, the, the petals of the rose off the rose. That's that rose petal smell. And the tar, like road tar like you, they've laid that down yeah there's a little and i like i like the little hint of it almost reminds me of like having a rose with a little chocolate just on the end of it there's just a little hint at the very end i will say when you taste barolo and there's different producers with different mentalities and approaches there's such a plushness here when you first taste it it's deep like you put it in your mouth and it's like, ooh, and it's got this creaminess and, and that is, to me, it's like, this is, this is super sexy and super exciting. Um, I would not be ashamed to pull out a 2017 Paolo Scavino Barolo. There are Barolos that you would be punished for opening in their youth. Now, again, this wine has had the benefit of being open for two days, but I have been I'm guilty of already popping about six bottles open at different occasions and sharing it with people to get their feedback because I'm super excited about this wine and I'm taking a pretty big position on it and I'm gonna have 2017 Paulo Scavino Barolo for a, a while because I don't think I'm gonna have a chance to have a wine of this quality and character at this price point for very much longer. Um, and so I'm grabbing a chunk and uh, I'm, uh, uh, I'm, 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 I wanna get your feedback, what you think about the wine because I'm, I want some confidence before I, I really go and grab as much wine as I'm talking about grabbing, but Ian's excited about me grabbing it. We're, we're, gonna, we're gonna go grab lunch and have a couple of bottles. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> but super exciting, right? Yeah, no, it's it's fantastic. I, when it was released uh, last fall, I, I had a half bottle um, that quickly was open for for one showing. I thought I could get another day out of it, and it it was gone by the end of the day. Yeah, I mean the was, jar the jar works really good um, because yeah. we fill them all the way to the top. I wouldn't want to fill them halfway, um, and uh, so you know I go to my Italian section. I go to Piedmont. And uh, I'm, I'm going to do this little thing, go uh, low to high. And uh, you don't get into Barolo until you start talking about, you know, 40 something dollars a bottle. And Scavino's name is just so good. These are these are really good wines, but they're they're not. Well, you know, they're not the name Paulo Scavino. And then you got 97 points from James Suckling on this wine. 90, oh, that was my score. 93 points from Parker. Um, but I really agree with Suckling on this particular wine. The blackberries, ripe strawberries, blue fruits. Um, drink after 2024, he says. Um, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm a... I'm a bull on this wine, and I really think it's uh, at 50 bucks. I think that uh, two years from now, we'll be talking about almost all Barolos of this quality and this ilk being north of $70 and, uh, and probably deserve to be uh, much, much higher. And when you talk about quality and what you're comparing it to in the wine world, um, and Barolo has not had a hard time taking price. It, it continues to go up. But this is, a, this is a great find. So, Ian, I want to thank you for representing Paulo tonight. I'm sorry we couldn't get the family on the Zoom. It's I wish not, we could have got him in, too. 
yeah we we definitely tried and they did too they they were they were trying to pull it together uh to be here they even talked about potentially being live with us but um we just couldn't pull it together um uh, but we really thank you guys for joining us for stars of italian wine i'm going to take you off uh uh spotlight cheers thank you Ian. thank you buddy um and i don't know if i spotlighted you or not did i I did. So um, I just wanted to open it up to the to the group and and hear some comments. If you had any favorite wines tonight, I'd love to know. Put that in the chat. Um, uh, I mean, it's hard to pick favorites because these are all awesome. Um, and that's what I did here. I put picked five favorite wines to be able to show you at the stars of Italian wine. Um, if I'm gonna, if I feel like having a white wine, I don't care what restaurant I'm at. Uh, if I had a bottle of Chavaro with me, I'd love to pull it out at any style of restaurant um, or family celebration. Um, I, I love Sicilian wines, and uh, there's something a little more hedonistic about Sicilian wines. And so, uh, when you're looking at Sicily, um, the the wine that we had tonight. The Rosso del Conte. Um, th this is a, a pretty famous wine, and uh, to be able to taste 2015, um, and just keep uh, keep an eye on this wine. When you, I was at uh, a top, I won't say the name of the restaurant. I saw this wine on uh, wine on the rest. Uh, it's a Michelin star here in Los Angeles. I saw this wine on the wine list for $150. Um, this is a very important wine when it comes to Sicily. And uh, uh, <clears throat> we go to Avionese, we have a top Merlot, we have a top uh, Rosso. Um, and I, I just wanted kind of to dot around Italy and pick some wines that are worth talking about and, 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 and bringing to your attention. They're not all the most expensive wines they're actually qu quite competitive uh, and um, in, in the world of wine, I think really represent a great value proposition. Favorite Italian restaurants, Michael Sierra said, Sierra said that uh, if anybody wants to put a couple of recommendations in the chat box, I have a lot that come to mind, Silvio. I uh, know you uh, have some great recommendations. What are some of your favorite Italians? Uh, the first place I think of is my buddy Sal Marino, um, Marino Restaurant, uh, a classic in LA. And if you go in there and say that Ian Blackburn sent you, uh, if you're vegetarian, and I go vegetarian about six months a year, go to Sal Marino because you tell him you're vegetarian, he'll put together like a five, six, seven course vegetarian menu that will you will not miss meat okay and he is the king of the farmer's market and his crudo if you like raw fish tremendous during the pandemic he had a michelin star sushi chef there in his restaurant and he let this restaurant this sushi, sushi chef stay in la and do sushi pop-up style for takeout. Uh, and uh, he, he's just super cool. The entire Italian wine community loves Sal Marino. Uh, Silvio, do you have some favorite places in LA? Well, I cannot talk about uh, my customers because uh, that becomes a political issue. I oh, shoot, shoot. So whatever has been mentioned, I agree. They're all great restaurants. <laughs> you have too many. That's why. Yeah. So, yeah, well, you <laughs> say that I have a lot of friends too. In the, in the <laughs> yeah, you do. You so do. I don't want to be you part. Do. That's a, that's good of you. That, uh, you know, Ian. I mean, you go back a long ways. So the show, I cannot the show talk is... about one and I'll talk about the other. Then yeah, the work have goes to, out. Have to roll and, I, the whole place. and I'd be ostracized by any restaurants in town. You know. So, so. <laughs> I appreciate it. You can you can send me a direct message because I'm, uh, I'm I'm forgetting some great places right now to talk about. Well, uh, come to my place. That's the best restaurant in uh, South Yeah, South for South sure. <laughs> I gotta come see you and your kids. Uh, 
am I not seeing any messages? Because uh, I don't know. I, I got Gales and Celestino from Ian. Uh, the, Ian, those are your accounts. You're not supposed to do that. They are my accounts, but I love them. <laughs> before, before I was selling wines, I would dine there all the time. They were phenomenal. <laughs> my my wife gets mad when I tell her I go to Gales for for business. Uh, Giorgio Baldi in 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 Santa Monica. Go to uh, Georgie. Uh, what's my guy's name on Beverly? Uh, from Umbria. Can you help? Can you help me remember Silvio the name of the restaurant? Famous. Uh, Dottore Angelini. Angelini. Come on. Well, it's not from Umbria, it's from Marche. Eh? In Marche? Careful, yes. Uh, well, he cooked Be for the Umbrians about... when they came to town, so that's why I thought he was from Umbria. Ah, okay. Yeah. Uh, let's see if I can remember a few other great ones. Well, we're at an hour and a half. I'm running out of time. But when I follow up on an email to thank you guys in the next day, I'll put a little list together of my favorite Italian places, and I'll I'll have a chance to look at a list and come up with those. But uh, they won't be places that uh, Ian calls on. But I like I do like Gales uh, and and Chelsea, But I, I I prefer the downtown LA. Uh, a version of Drago uh, and with Piero Savaggio at the door from Valentino. Phenomenal. And uh, I, I, and the wine guy there is fantastic. And um, that, that's a great spot. I want to thank you all for joining us tonight. And I know that we're running a little bit long, but thank you for joining us and enjoy the website. Grab some bottles. Remember, you're going to get a t shirt. You get 10% off, um, and we will get those wines to you as soon as you place the order. And I thank you for joining us to this evening, and uh, stay good. Uh, we have uh, Stars of Spain um, coming up next in our Stars lineup for next month, and I'm putting together an incredible lineup. We're going to make that available for purchase on Friday. Um, we are still working on a couple of wines um, to be able to announce so that'll be our next uh, Zoom version. We've got some live events coming into the world. We've got dinners. Um, and one fun dinner I want to uh, mention to you is our Korean wine, uh, Korean barbecue and wine dinner. We just did one. It was so much fun. Everybody said they were going to come back and do it again. So we put another date on the on the menu. On the, uh, we sold it out, and so many people were emailing me that wanted to come that couldn't. So we'll be we're doing it again on uh, May nineteenth. It's at Umbu Grill, one of my favorite places to go to. I've been going there for years. Super fresh, super clean, modern, and a great spot for us to do our event. And we'll do the same uh, space with that. So join us there, um, and uh, I'll see you at Stars of Spain if not sooner. Thank you, everybody. Have a great night. Thank you. <laughs>